Hey everybody, this is Stuart. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we are a little bit behind on our new episodes. I wanted to just drop a quick note in and say, don't worry, everything is fine. We've just had some scheduling difficulties. We had a couple cancellations, a couple moving things around, and a couple of conflicts, and so we're just a little bit behind. But we should be back on our regular schedule of releasing an episode on the first and third Mondays of every month. Hopefully soon. I don't know if we're going to get something out on the third Monday of April, to tell you the truth, because it's Monday, April 10th. The third Monday of April is next week, and we don't actually currently have anything scheduled. Um, but if we don't have anything out by then, uh, then we will come out with another April episode and get back on schedule for May. Uh, so we appreciate your patience there. Um, and uh, But in the meantime, I want you to enjoy this re-aired conversation with the great Annie Schofield. I'm really excited about that. Uh, we got my, this is where we got my all-time favorite audio from the entire program was in this episode. And so uh, you'll recognize it, I think, because Annie is live from the Lake Guardian, which is the big research vessel that they have out um, touring the Great Lakes. So enjoy that. Uh, before I transition to it, though, we do have a couple of announcements. Um, we just recorded an Ask Dr. Fish today. Look for that in your feed later this week or maybe early next week. Maybe we'll just do that next Monday. I haven't figured it out yet. And we have a bunch of live events coming up. Uh, we will be live at the Emerging Contaminants Conference in Urbana-Champaign. That is next week. I want to say that's next Tuesday night. Tuesday night. Yep, Tuesday, April 18th um, at the Emerging Contaminants Conference. We're still finalizing our guest list there, but that should be really fun. Uh, that'll be Carolyn and I live from that conference. Then we will also be IAGLER. We're going to be owning IAGLER, the International Association for Great Lakes Research in Toronto. We'll be having Ask Dr. Fish live 3 p.m. May 8th. That'll be at the Hilton Hotel where the conference is. And then probably May 9th, the very next day, we're going to have Teach Me About the Great Lakes live from a noisy pub. We are finalizing which noisy pub, but uh, look forward to that. So a couple of live events coming up. So if you're in Toronto, where IAGLER is, or if you're coming to the Emergence, Emerging Contaminant Conference, come on over uh, and check it out. We'll have stickers. Yeah, probably won't have stickers at the Contaminants Conference because they're on back order. But uh, we will have stickers. Uh, we will have fellowship. Um, if you ask me nicely, um, I will buy you a beer. I probably won't buy you a beer. Actually, ask me nicely. We'll see. Um, but even if I don't buy you a beer, I will say hello uh, and give you a sticker if we have one. Anyway, enough of that. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for your patience as we work through these scheduling difficulties. Don't worry. We're not going anywhere. We still have hundreds of episodes left in us. Um, we just have to actually get them scheduled. Anyway, enjoy this Teach Me About the Great Lakes. This was episode 30 with the great Annie Schofield. Uh, and this was in the summer of 2021, I believe, is when we released this one initially. And so uh, I hope you enjoy it as much as we did. Yeah, April 2021, so about two years ago, uh, today, roughly. Thanks a lot for listening, and of course, keep grading those lakes. Teach me about the Great Lakes. Teach me about the Great Lakes. Cha! Welcome back to Teach Me About the Great Lakes, a twice-monthly podcast in which I, a Great Lakes novice, ask people who are smarter and harder working than I am to teach me all about the Great Lakes. My name is Stuart Carlton, and I work with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, and I am joined today by my good friend, Rini Miles. Rini, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's Monday morning, and um, it's, a, it's a cold week coming this way, but, you know, Spring is coming again. <laughs> uh, that's what they claim. I looked at my little phone forecast thing and it said 100% chance of snow tomorrow. Um, and we have like a weather complaints Slack group. And I haven't logged on to Slack in a while, but I'm going to log on to Slack this afternoon to enter that into the weather complaints because it's not even early April at this point And this snow thing is ridiculous. But uh, yeah, I hear you. I'm fine. Actually, I'm really more than fine because uh, we have a chance today to talk to uh, an old friend of uh, Illinois, Indiana Sea Grant, um, Annie Schofield. And she's actually literally, well, figuratively, I think, on a boat, literally uh, in port um, while she's doing a, uh, the spring survey with EPA on the, their cool book called the Lake Guardian. So I'm pumped about this opportunity because how often do you get to talk to someone on a boat? I was just going to say not much. That's that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. That's why I'm here. <laughs> That's why I'm here, too. And uh, even more important than that, though, Annie is, of course, a researcher, which means we get to do uh, the researcher feature theme song. So very excited about that. Let's do that. And then we'll talk to Annie. Researcher feature. A feature in which a researcher going to teach us about the Great Lakes. 
Our guest today is Dr. Annie Schofield. She is the chief scientist on the research vessel Lake Guardian, and she's also the lead for the biology monitoring program with the EPA Great Lakes National Program Office. And Annie, you're on spring survey right now. So where are we talking to you from? Hi, Stuart. Really excited to be here today. Currently, the Lake Guardian is in port in Duluth, Minnesota. So we have finished most of the sampling for our spring sur survey. We've been through all of the lakes, and we just have a few sites left on Lake Superior to sample on our way back to port in Milwaukee in the next few days. How long have you been out then? We have been out since April 1st, uh, so oh almost my. 20 days now. Yeah, a, a while. Wow, what's it like to be on a ship for that length of time? You know, it's just kind of a different pace of life out here. Our, our schedules are really different. We each uh, work 12-hour shifts from 4 a.m. to 4 p.m. Or, or the opposite for the night shift. I actually am pretty used to being on boats for extended periods of time. I've done that quite a bit in my life now. So it's a different pace than on shore, but I really enjoy it. Um, just being out and doing field work is really fun. Is there like a seasickness situation for some people or is everybody pretty used to it at this point? Unfortunately, there are always some challenges with that, depending on uh, on the sea state. I myself do get seasick sometimes, so uh, it's definitely a challenge. But, um, you know, usually if the weather's too bad, we aren't able to sample reliably anyway. So we kind of duck in, um, try and try and ride it out. Uh, but, yeah, we, we deal with it the best we can. What kind of sampling are you all doing anyway? Like you use nets, I assume. Like, do you, are they trawls or do you set out nets and come and pick them up? What kind of what kind of work do you all do? We do uh, a lot of different work to look at all components of the lower food web. So by that, I mean everything in the lakes below the level of fish. So um, mostly the way we sample is we uh, drive around the lakes and we stop at our long-term monitoring sites and we deploy a, a variety of things. Uh, we collect water samples and put instruments down to take data uh, just of water quality. We also tow nets, but we don't uh, generally... Um, move around with the nets. We do stationary nets. So we put one down all the way to the bottom or however deep you want to tow for zooplankton uh, and then just bring it back to the surface. So they're vertical net tows um, instead of towing them around. We also take grabs of the lake bottom of the sediment. Um, those are the main things that we do on these surveys. But of course, and we also have a lot of other surveys that we do that aren't just the routine spring and summer monitoring surveys and deploy all sorts of different equipment on those too. So how long till so you're pulling these nets up? How long did so you drop them down and you pull them with vertical sampling? Is it take like I don't even know what the depths are. Like Michigan is the deepest Great Lake, right? I think I've learned that on this show. Lake Superior, I think. Oh, uh, is deepest. Yep. What is Lake Michigan? It's got some deal. It is pretty deep. How about that, Lake Michigan? It's pretty deep. Lake Superior is the deepest. Man, Lake Superior is always. Just get out of here with that. That's what I said. Yeah. Superiors. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> that's that's enough. <laughs> uh, anyway, I feel like Lake Michigan is the deepest, even if it's not actually. But my point is this. How long does it take to, like, drop one down and then pull it up? Like, is that, like, is it, like, you know, zippy? Or is that something you leave it down for a certain amount of time? It takes a while. It depends on the depth, obviously. So we deploy our equipment mostly at the, the same speed, no matter how deep it is. Our typical uh rate for deploying wire uh, that has equipment on it is, I think, half a meter per second. So you can do the math on that. Uh, sometimes it's really quick in Lake Erie, but when we get to our sites that are close to, we have some stations in Lake Superior that are, you know, 200 something, close to 300 meters. That's quite a long time. We don't put everything down all the way to the bottom of the lake, but when we do, for example, mycid toes at night, those are really big nets that we use to collect mycids, and they live deep in the water column. So we send those all the way down to the bottom, and we do two of them when we do a uh, sample for mycids. So those can take a pretty long time, um, even you know 20 minutes or something like that for each net. So when you're um, when you're on the ship that long and you're sampling every day more or less, what happens to the samples? Do they just kind of pile up till later? Or are you are you working on them as you go? They do pile up till later. <laughs> That's a very accurate. Uh, description. So we collect all of these samples. Most of the different types of samples we collect, we preserve in some way. Um, so water samples for nutrients, we do that with. We also, um, you know, zooplankton or benthic invertebrate samples will preserve and take back to the lab where taxonomists can look at those samples under the microscope later. And it'll take a long time to process those samples. There are a few things we analyze on board, like some of our nutrients, dissolved reactive phosphorus, uh, for example, we do on board, but a lot of the stuff is analyzed later. 
and so then so scientists look at the data right and they get all this and and uh it, it they process it over many months i would assume what do they what do they do with all of this stuff that you collect like how does the data use are the data used uh like in, in management decisions or, or or how are they used our data are directly used in management decisions um and that's you know the goal of the long-term monitoring program is to track changes across all five of the lakes that are occurring um over time and that directly informs our um, our lakewide action and management plans and also fisheries groups. So um, people who are doing modeling of the lakes to understand how many fish we should stock or other things like that or, or how, how changing um, regulations might affect the lakes. These data go into you know, models and things like that. So definitely these data are used. And I will just say, you know, these data are able to be collected because um, we are really fortunate to have funding through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative that keeps this program going so that we have a continuous stream of data to plug into um, that, that process of adaptive management. So it's really important for those decisions, I would say. How far back does that data go? I don't even know. It occurred to me. Like we have, a, so you've been doing it for quite some, well, not you specifically, but, but EPA and Glenpo have been doing this for a long time. How far back does the data go? Yeah, so the monitoring program, as we know it, began in the 1980s. Um, different lakes were added at a little bit different times, depending on um, when we thought we needed to start monitoring them. So I think Lake Superior was the last one added in 1992. Yeah, a few decades now, we have been monitoring the lakes, going out and doing the same type of sampling year after year, so that we can track long-term changes in the food web health and water quality. Well, that's interesting. You have this long data set, and I think that that uh, brings up kind of the next thing I want to talk about, which is good. And that is, what long-term changes have you seen in the Great Lake? You know, what can we see through this data set? What what are changes to the area that, that are apparent? So there have been a lot of changes across all of the Great Lakes over the last several decades. Uh, some of the key ones that have affected how the lakes are functioning are, first, I would say, uh, changes to the nutrients coming into the lake, uh, and second, I would say invasive species impacts, especially mussels, uh, zebra and quagga mussels. So first, uh, nutrients. So a lot of the lakes have, have become clearer and had fewer nutrients going to, into the lake over time. So this has really affected, especially Lake Ontario, Lake Michigan, and Lake Huron. Um, you might recall in the 1970s, you know, there were a lot of water quality issues um, around that time. And the 1972 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement um, was actually a really big success story uh, in terms of management and, and conservation of the Great Lakes. So what we saw is in response to the targets that they set, uh, nutrients really decreased. And in these lakes, we have seen them getting clearer, getting cleaner, uh, less algae growing uh, in the offshore waters of the lakes. And that's also impacted the zooplankton and, and everything else. And then another thing that has really affected the lakes are invasive species. So as I mentioned, um, zebra mussels kind of came in first and now quagga mussels, which are kind of a cousin of zebra mussels have taken over and they've expanded throughout all of the lakes uh, and they filter algae out of the water column and make it clearer, really change how nutrients cycle through the lake and just completely um, change the food web and, and how these lakes are functioning. So what we're seeing is a big interaction between how nutrients have changed and how mussels are impacting to the lake so that um, you know Michigan and Huron are almost like Lake Superior in terms of water quality now and and how much allergies in the lakes like productivity and stuff so um, big changes for sure. With Michigan um, specifically the waters my understanding is the water is a lot clearer now than it used to be is that is that what you've noticed? That is accurate the water is much clearer and getting clearer still. So. And so someone I work with, I won't say his name, but you know him, <laughs> will say unofficially that the water in Lake Michigan is maybe even too clear at this point. Uh, and so without asking you to evaluate that, uh, um, uh, do you think it's, you know, the, you're seeing the water clarity really influence the way the food web works? And what is what are sort of the, can you tell us what the changes are, I guess? Sure. There are, there are certainly concerns about the water being too clear or that really translates to the lake not being quite as productive. Um, so not as much algae growing and that trickles all the way up the food web to fish eventually. Um, and the concerns about that are because fisheries are really important to the Great Lakes um, in a lot of ways. And so that's kind of, I think where people are coming from when they're saying it's too clear is, is concern for uh, the fish populations that the lake can support. So clear water can impact everything. It impacts where algae can grow in the water column or on the bottom. Um, of the lake, how, how deep light is reaching. It also has impacts like 
UV radiation can impact zooplankton and larval fish um, and make them need to move deeper in the water column or, or cause issues. So there are a lot of things that water clarity can impact um, that you might not think about uh, at first, including you know how we sample and, and things like that. So it's a really complex issue uh, is the short story. <laughs> there's some really great things about clear water and there's some concerns about it getting too clear as well. So um, I was uh, wondering about the, the quagga mussels. Um, it's my understanding they're kind of more of a problem, which I guess I'm oversimplifying, than zebra mussels right now. How did that happen? How did they push their cousins out? So almost all of the mussels in the Great Lakes now are quagga mussels. You're right about that. And, and what we've seen is they've kind of outcompeted zebra mussels. It seems like I'm not sure that we know, you know, exactly why that is the case. But what we do know is that they can live in a wider range of habitats, so they can actually move all the way to really deep offshore sites. So you look at 100 meters in Lake Michigan, and it's just like a carpet of quagga mussels. So um, zebra mussels mostly we're staying closer to shore on rocky substrates. And it seems like quagga mussels are able to, uh, you know, live in a, a wider range of habitats. So that's that's probably part of it. Um, and yeah, they, they are continuing to have really big impacts and expanding into deeper waters and in the different lakes um, and altering the food web. So shifting gears a bit, uh, there are kind of a couple of big trends, right? So you're doing this in the year 2021, right? You're doing a spring survey. Uh, and there are a couple of big trends that I'm kind of curious about, uh, uh, societal trends, I guess, um, that I want to ask about. So the first is, you know, we're still in the middle of, of COVID and the, the pandemic. What have you all done about that to stay safe? I mean, you're in this really confined area, right? So it seems risky. What kind of precautions have you all taken? And, and do you find it that's really influenced the way that you've done your work or, or not? That's a good question. And the short answer is yes, there's been a lot of thought and planning going into our COVID safety. So all of our surveys last year in 2020 were canceled, actually. We were not able to do those in a way that we felt was safe. And this year, um, this is the first survey of the year. We're hoping to do more. Uh, the precautions that we took prior to this survey are everyone who is on board was in a hotel in isolation for two weeks before we got on the boat. And we did testing at the start and the end of that period. So everyone came in without having had contact and having tested negative prior to being on the boat. Even so, on the vessel, we are wearing masks and making sure to clean things really frequently, you know, um, being really cautious and, and, and that sort of thing. So it's definitely been a, a big effort uh, to get this to happen safely. That's amazing. So, so you left on April 1st, but you had to show up in the middle of March then and just hang out in a hotel room. Yes. Unbelievable level of dedication. Hopefully, hopefully there's hazard pay. Uh, but uh, no, you don't have to comment on it either. So the other uh, big societal trend I think that is worth talking about is this has been like the spring of sea shanties. Um, and so like, are people singing a lot of sea shanties on the boat or is it kind of something you're sick of at this point? I wish I could say that people were singing sea shanties. I don't think I've heard a single one. Are you are you completely unaware of the sea shanty thing? That just occurred to me. Maybe you're so disconnected. You know, on, honestly, I am. I, I'm out of oh. the loop. I have not heard about this. Um, I do really like sea shanties. And when I worked at Sea Education Association as a sailboats doing uh, study abroad programs in oceanography, there were lots of sea shanties in that world. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I am not a great singer myself, but I enjoy listening to other people sing them. So, yeah, I, I hadn't heard of this trend. We're a little bit isolated. We have internet, but um, don't have a lot of browsing capacity. You can't waste it on, on TikTok. Okay, that makes sense. This was a whole thing. <laughs> no. I think it's, I assume the fact that I know about it now means it's over, which is fine. But yeah, there was uh, some dude like did a, a sea shanty called the Wellerman and then it became like this wondrous uh, thing that happened where people were adding on to it and changing it and everything. And it was really great. That sounds fantastic. Anyway, and so to have missed the sea shanties is very sad, but I think that's, that's probably okay. Uh, so you go across all five Great Lakes. And I think of them as, you know, you think of the Great Lakes as like a region, but is that fair to, and a lot of the Great Lakes kind of, they all drain into each other and, and whatever, but are they really similar or they kind of tend to differ? What are the, like the most notable differences among the lakes, I suppose? That's a good question and uh, maybe a little bit of a different one, a difficult one, but all of the Great Lakes are certainly unique. They have, you know, they have similar biological communities, but they all have uh, their distinct their distinct features as well. So as we move through the Great Lakes, it is fun to look at the differences, whether that be in you know how productive the lake is, the water chemistry, um, the species that we find there, the depth 
to the lake. Um, probably the biggest contrast that I could draw would be between Lake Erie and Lake Superior. <laughs> so those are kind of the end points. And then the other lakes fall somewhere in between in terms of a lot of the different characteristics. So Lake Erie is really shallow and each basin of Lake Erie is almost a lake in itself because they're all so different. Um, and then Lake Superior is the deepest lake. And it's interesting when we're out here, when we sample the North shore of Lake Superior, the basimetry just drops off really fast. So we're in 200 meters of water sampling, but we can see the shore, uh, which is really cool and, and different than the other lakes where we're mostly out in the middle of the lake, just water all around us. I see. Oh, so the bathymetry, help me with that. that that's like how quickly, the that's what the lake bottom looks like, right? And how quickly it drops off, essentially? Yeah, so it's like topography, you know, mountains, but opposite and the bottom, <laughs> the bottom of the lake. <laughs> so do the lakes um, all have similar issues in terms of their food web, um, you know, with the zebra mussels and quagga mussels and the rest of the story? So there are similarities and differences. I would say Lake Michigan and Lake Huron have fairly similar stories right now in terms of these drastic increases in water clarity and interaction with the mussels and crashes or declines, I'll say, in, in some of the biomass of different organisms, including fish. Lake Superior is kind of the steady, steadier lake. You know, there haven't been as drastic a changes in Lake Superior. There aren't a lot of uh, mussels established in Lake Superior and just a little bit of a unique or different lake. And then um, Lake Erie is the other end of the spectrum, again, where, especially the Western Basin, which is really shallow, has very different issues than some of the other areas. Um, they still, you know, there are issues with harmful algal blooms or cyanobacteria blooms you've probably heard about in that area. So um, some similarities, but also some differences. Well, related to that, because, yeah, we don't have harmful algal blooms really here in, in Lake Michigan. That's not a thing, at least in our part of Lake Michigan, but it is elsewhere. Is the, so does the increased water clarity that you're seeing and reduced product reduce productivity, does that influence the presence of HABs or is it, uh, is it kind of a separate deal? Do they just, you know, uh, uh, sort of churn up regardless? Generally speaking, when you have fewer nutrients coming into the lake, that's associated with less algae growing and more clear water. And so there is a correlation there. You know, most most systems that are relatively low nutrient systems or oligotrophic as we would call it, uh, like Lake Michigan, don't have a lot of issues with uh, cyanobacterial blooms or harmful algal blooms. Um, so there's definitely a correlation. What's interesting is actually there, there have been some increases in abundance um, or at least you know noteworthy abundances of cyanobacteria uh, in oligotrophic systems too. So there, there's a group in Lake Superior that's studying that. Um, right now, a lot of people working on trying to understand those, but it's on a, a very different scale than like what we see in Lake Erie. Well, Annie, this is all really interesting stuff, and it sounds like you're doing good and important work as part of the, the spring survey. Uh, but that's actually not why we invited you here on Teach Me About the Great Lakes. The reason that we invited you on to Teach Me About the Great Lakes is this. If you could choose to have a great donut for breakfast or a great sandwich for lunch, which one would you choose? That is a critically important question, Stuart. Thank you for asking it. Uh, I will, I think I would have to say that a great sandwich for lunch would be my preference. Um, I do like sweets a lot, uh, like dessert, but I prefer it um, to be in the evening rather than in the morning. So I'm going to go with the sandwich. Gotcha. And are you, are you in the Glimp office in Chicago? Is that where you work normally when not on a boat? I, yes, will um, be working in the Glimpo office in Chicago. That is where I'm based. I haven't, uh, I actually started about a year ago, so have not ever gone into the office regularly um, with the EPA. So I've <laughs> been working remotely this whole time. My follow-up question is supposed to be, where can I go to get a sandwich in Chicago? But I'm going to phrase it this way instead. So w what is the best thing to eat on the RV Lake Guardian when you're out there? Like, I assume the food situation is is maybe not West Lafayette levels of bleak, but it's not ideal. Um, but what is the best thing to eat uh, on the boat? So we do have pretty good food here on the Lake Guardian because we have... Uh, you know, cooks that have a lot of experience and, and make good and different food every day. I think it'd be hard to say what the best thing to eat out here would be. I think it would be, you know, whatever, whatever's for dinner. You know, there, there, we, we eat whatever the cook makes. And uh, generally speaking, we're really fortunate to have great food out here on the survey. So it is better than West Lafayette, actually, maybe in, in that sense. You know, I, as you know, I've lived in West Lafayette as well. Um, and it, it's different. Yeah, may, maybe a, a little more variety out here even <laughs> than you would see in that area. 
And then uh, the second one of our ending questions is this. So you're you're the chief scientist on the, the Lake Guardian and you're a, like a, a lead for the biology monitoring program. What is it that makes you good at your job, right? What are some key skills for this kind of work or for working on a research vessel kind of generally? So serving in this role um, requires that I have a lot of different skill sets, I would say. So obviously I have a foundation in, in the science and understanding the sampling that we're doing and the, the standard operating procedures and all of that stuff and, and training people. Um, but I would say this job, a lot of it, um, what makes me or anyone else good at it is also the soft skills that we have to bring to the table. So it's not just about coordinating the science, it's also about managing people and making sure that everyone is, you know, um, getting along well on the boat. Boats can be a little bit of a challenging environment sometimes. Uh, you're all in close quarters, people are tired, working crazy hours and stuff like that. Um, so you have to be able to talk to people uh, even when you're not at your best or when they're not at their best. Um, and then also I'd say problem solving is a really big uh, part of the job. You know, when something's not working, you got to figure out how to make it work with limited resources on the boat. Uh, so that is definitely really important. And lastly, I'll add that uh, it turns out <laughs> being chief scientist on Lake Guardian also comes with some responsibilities to talk to the press and the media along the way. So we've had a lot of media coverage on this spring survey. So I've done some radio interviews, some print interviews for print, um, as well as some live TV segments along the way, which is something completely new to me. No kidding. How did that go? Like, were you able to adapt okay? I haven't really done TV. Yeah, it was actually really fun. I found the live TV was actually easier than maybe some of the stuff for radio or for, um, you know, phone or Zoom interviews, just because you're talking to an actual person and you can kind of read those those cues and stuff like that. We were distanced, you know, not right next to each other. I was on the boat, they were on shore, but the energy is really different when it's live um, compared to when it's recorded. Well, actually, I do have one more question. I'm not going to lie. Okay. Um, and that question is this. So, I mean, you're right next to the boat, right? Are you on the boat literally or next to it? We are literally on the boat. We have not stepped foot off of the boat since we got on the boat. And that is part of our COVID safety plans. So you're important. You, you don't even get to go off the boat? We do not get to get off the boat. We are a bubble. So we're staying here. Huh. The, I guess, very minor exception is that we have done some no contact delivery or drop off sort of situations of equipment and food for groceries. Um, and so there's stuff, you know, we leave it on the dock and someone picks it up or they leave it on the dock and then we come out and pick it up. Um, so we've stepped foot on the dock for those purposes, but we've not left, <laughs> not not gone anywhere uh, otherwise. So uh, we're, we're all staying put. Well, since you're literally on the boat, here's, here's the question I want to ask. And that is this. Do you think it would be possible to maybe ask someone to honk the horn on the boat? I mean, just for us, if you ask very nicely. I can certainly ask. It will take me uh, just a minute to get up to the, the pilot house and see if that's an option. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll see what I can do for you. I'll go ahead and bring you with me. I might, I'll put my headphones around my neck. <laughs> I won't be able to hear you the whole time. Or actually, maybe I ought to just take you off my headphones. It works for you. It works for me. I will. I will just go see if anyone is even in the pilot house. They're probably going to be very confused by this. One second. I found. I found the captain. All right. Good news. We can uh, blow a salute. He says. This is the best day of my life. I love this. <laughs> Where are they at? They're, they're on the dock. No, they're on the phone. Oh. <laughs> Open the uh, door. Open the door. Okay, I'll go outside so you can hear it better. All right, here we go. That might be the greatest moment of my entire life. <laughs> that was an awesome sound. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. This is, this is our Captain, Captain Dean, if you want to say hi to him. Hello. Hi there, Captain Dean. My name is Stuart. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I hope that blows the snow away anyway. We had some snow this morning there for a couple hours. Snow in April? Oh, yeah, it was like 27 degrees here and uh, supposed to be 21 tomorrow, uh, uh, tonight, I mean. Oh, my goodness. But uh, that snow doesn't last. I mean, it's just like snow in July. You know, it hits the ground and it's gone. No, I don't know. I've not experienced snow in July. <laughs> 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 All right. So you got your wish. Oh, I got more than my wish. Oh, thank you so much for putting up with our nonsense um, or my nonsense. I want to be very clear. This is one person's nonsense only. Uh, I do not speak for the program. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, that's amazing. It's so fun and interesting to talk to somebody uh, in this situation. When when is your next big cruise that you're going to be on? So we are hoping to have several other surveys this season. Uh, The next one that will be up is in July. We're going to do an intensive survey of Lake Michigan to look at the community on the bottom of the lake, uh, benthic invertebrates. So that's our big survey in July. We'll be out again for our summer survey going through all five of the lakes in August. Oh, awesome. Well, hopefully we'll be uh, talking to you again uh, during one of those. But in between now and then, Annie, where can people go to find out more about the surveys and your work and and things like that? So there's a lot of information about our monitoring program on our website. And also there's some resources like um, the Lake Michigan story map that was developed by Illinois and Indiana Sea Grant uh, that's available uh, to learn more about what's going on in the Great Lakes. Fantastic. And we'll put links to those in our show notes, which you can find right now. Either just look down at your phone or fire up your web browser and go to teachmeaboutthegreatlakes.com slash 30. That's three zero because this is episode 30. Uh, Dr. Annie Schofield, chief scientist for the RV Lake Guardian and lead for the biology monitoring program at the EPA Great Lakes National Program Office. Thank you so much for coming on and teaching us all about the Great Lakes. Thanks for having me. It was really fun. Well, that was something. <laughs> yeah, that was that was great. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely uh, put a nice little uh, button on my morning, I think. And uh, you know, I learned. I mean, it's great to talk to Annie, and the work they do there is is so important through the EPA, and they're such good partners too. Uh, so it's 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 nice to hear um, that a they're able to do it this year despite COVID stuff, and that b they're doing their usual bang up job. Yes, indeed. Yeah, because they um, they have a long history of keeping the lakes monitored and and uh no and it's all good yep yeah i can't imagine so they've been on a boat forever essentially at this point you know and almost a month when you count the the pre-quarantine time that's a that's a long time i think you get a little bit batty there um but it sounds like she's doing great which is awesome uh rini well where can people go to find out more about all the awesome stuff we do at illinois indiana sea grant i ask you because i can't ever remember yeah um our website is um iic grant yeah dot org yeah um and we do lots of tweets, right? We do the tweets at, um, hang on, I know this. I could do this. I-L-I-N-C Grant. That's our tweeting. Um, or if you want to, the show, the show uh, account is uh, Teach Great Lakes on Twitter. At Teach Great Lakes. You can find out about the stuff we're doing there. Um, and with that, thank you, everybody, for listening in. We will uh, see you on the first Monday of every month and the third Monday of most months. And I'm going to pretend that we are releasing this on time. And uh, in between now and then, everybody stay safe, have fun, and uh, keep grating those lakes. <laughs>